History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 370th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're bringing everybody to a place that we visited in the last couple of months here. That is Old Wilmington in North Carolina. We had such a fun trip. I can't wait to bring this to everyone. We did. This was my second time visiting that city. I would say this time was a lot more fun than the first time because this can be kind of a party town and very loud. And because we're dealing with COVID, it was a lot quieter, although it was pretty loud still. We could hear all the yelling and stuff, even from the USS (laughs) North Carolina when we were doing the ghost hunt over there. This is true. While we were there, we did a ghost tour. And so we're going to be sharing with you a bunch of the haunted locations that we not only heard about on the ghost tour, but that we've also heard about in other places. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Eric Laurel, and we have two Ashleys, Ashley C and Ashley N. Welcome to the crew, guys. And now, this moment, Noddity. The largest obelisk in the world is not only not finished, it is not standing upright. The unfinished obelisk is located in Aswan, Egypt. The construction of the obelisk was started by the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, Hatshepsut. A unique thing about this pharaoh was that she was female the second confirmed female pharaoh. Anyway, the obelisk was carved directly out of bedrock. As they separated it from the bedrock, cracks began to form and the project was abandoned. Had the Egyptians been able to complete the project and get this monstrous thing upright, it would have been a third larger than any other obelisk, standing over 10 stories tall. Now as to how the Egyptians had planned to lift, what would have weighed the equivalent of 200 African elephants is anyone's guess. We imagine ancient alien theorists would claim that the mothership would have come and levitated it upright. Too bad the thing cracked, because that would have been a sight to see. You can visit the open-air museum and see the unfinished obelisk, which certainly is odd. Scared yet? Boo! <laughs> And now, this month in history. In the month of January, on the 3rd in 1938, the March of Dimes Foundation was created. The March of Dimes started as the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, founded by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The main focus was to battle polio, which had afflicted the president. The organization funded Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. After that early success, the group moved their focus to preventing birth defects, infant mortality, and helping premature babies. They help mothers to understand pregnancy and guide them through the entire process. The name March of Dimes was coined by screen and radio star Eddie Cantor. He got it from the radio and newsreel series The March of Time. He called for a nationwide fundraising campaign, and lapel pins were sold for 10 cents each. People literally mailed in dimes by the thousands. President Roosevelt said, During the past few days, bags of mail have been coming, literally by the truckload, to the White House. Yesterday, between 40 and 50,000 letters came to the mailroom of the White House. Today, an even greater number. How many, I cannot tell you, for we can only estimate the actual count by counting the mailbags. In all the envelopes are dimes and quarters and even dollar bills, gifts from grown-ups and children, mostly from children, who want to help other children get well. It is glorious to have one's birthday associated with a work like this.
During the antebellum era, Wilmington was the largest city in North Carolina. From its earliest days, the city was a rowdy place with pirates like Anne Bonny, Calico Jack, and Blackbeard making their way up the Cape Fear River. Wilmington was an attractive place for commerce as well, due to its location on the water. Its production of naval supplies made it politically powerful, and many of its residents rich. The city today is a balance of historical charm and college town. Many locations in the town have ghost stories connected to them. Join us as we share the history and haunts of Old Wilmington. The French were the first to explore the Cape Fear River. This ominous name reflected the rough waters and foreboding shoals of the river. Old Wilmington was originally known as New Liverpool, having been named for the English city, and many of the streets still carry the same names as the streets in Liverpool, England. I wish I would have known that ahead of time and kind of looked around, And although I've never been to Liverpool, so why would I know? <laughs> well, it still would have been interesting to know Yeah. prior to. The name Wilmington came from Spencer Compton, the Earl of Wilmington. The city incorporated in 1739. The Revolutionary War would bring British occupation, and the Civil War would feature the building of Fort Fisher, which helped to keep the Confederates supplied. The largest naval bombardment of the 19th century caused the fort to fall. After the war, the city enjoyed a building boom. The city took care to preserve its historic buildings, and by 1974, much of the downtown had been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The first time I visited Wilmington, I remembered it being very loud, Kelly. This was clearly a college town, and everybody was out partying. There were pubs all up and down the street. There are still quite a few pubs. We did sit down and have a beer with Dolly at one of them. We sure did, and it was delightful. It was. We had a couple of local brews. Very nice. And Kelly, part of the problem with this being a party college town is I did the exact same ghost tour that we had done this time, the Ghost Walk of Wilmington. And I told everybody it was the second worst ghost tour I'd ever been on. And I'll tell you the reason why is because this city is so loud. It just ruined the tour for me because I couldn't hear anything that the tour guide was saying. We had like a group of 40, so you couldn't really get close to the tour guide. And it was just so loud. I couldn't even hear half the story she was telling us. Oh, so disappointing. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is a lot of historic buildings are right there with all that stuff, too. There were a couple places that she took us up the hill. And so it was a little bit more quiet there. But yeah, so I was like, this was horrible. And it would have helped if she'd had something to project her voice. Certainly. So COVID helped to make the second visit better because the town was much quieter. Not that I'm a fan, obviously, of COVID, but it did make it quieter. This uh, Ghost Walk of Wilmington is set up in such a way that multiple tours go out each evening, and some of them are even at the same time. I know when we went, there was another one going at the same time, too. Yep, there was. And the interesting thing is you think, well, gosh, aren't they going to kind of run into each other hitting all the same places? Maybe, you know, one of them walks one route around this way and then the other one and somewhere we're going to crash in the middle, aren't we? Well, they actually take you to different spots on the tours. And I know that to be a fact because we didn't go to some of the spots that I'd been on with the first tour. That's kind of nice. So if you ever revisit, mm -hmm. you can just do another one and you're going to hit something new every time, it sounds like. Exactly. So on this one, that was the case for me. I was like, I don't remember this place before. I don't remember this place before. So here we're going to share with you several of the locations that are reputedly haunted in Wilmington. First up, we have the Latimer House. The Latimer House is located at 126 South 3rd Street. Zebulon Latimer was a very successful man one of the most successful in Old Wilmington, and his success helped the city to become the largest city in the state of North Carolina during the antebellum era. He started a dry goods business, much of which was naval goods. Latimer also invested in the railroad and dredging of the Cape Fear River and canals. These endeavors made him a rich man. Zebulon married Elizabeth Savage, and they had their 10,000-square-foot home built in 1852. The builders were J.C. and R.B. Wood, and the house was designed in the Italianate revival style. The house was located on a bluff overlooking the Cape Fear River on the corner of 3rd and Orange Streets. The foyer was breathtaking, with hand-painted floral wall designs and a grand staircase made from heart of pine. That staircase is not going anywhere. That's some tough wood. Yes, it is. There were 11 rooms. The old iron fence that surrounded the house was apparently yanked out of their family plots in Oakdale Cemetery. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine you're just riding through the cemetery, looking at some of your family plots and going, you know, this fence that's around our plot, it's kind of nice. I 
Looks nice around the house, don't you think, dear? <laughs> Let's just pull that out and take it home with us. And oh, they did. Oh, word. <laughs> I guess they figured, hey, it's our family plot. We can do with it whatever we want. I guess so. Might. Any attachments be damned. <laughs> yeah, might have, might have caused some trouble for them later. We'll find out. The Latimers would have nine children, Kelly, so they did have quite a few. And even worse is five of them died before the age of five. Oh. I mean, we do know that's part of the reason why they would have so many kids, because unfortunately you lose so many. And you think about nowadays when a family loses just one child, it can be so devastating. Can you imagine five? Absolutely not. And all of them young before the age of five. The Latimers were slave owners and had a small brick building behind the house that served as slave quarters. After the Civil War, nearly all of the slaves left, but they remained in contact with the family and exchanged letters, so there must have been somewhat of a good relationship there. One of the slaves stayed on as a servant and was still a part of the household on the 1930 census. The Lower Cape Fear Historical Society, Inc. bought the Latimer House from Herbert Russell Latimer Jr. in 1963, and they made it their headquarters. Today, the house is a museum and event center that is open six days a week and features 14 rooms full of antiques, many of which are original to the home. There's artwork and neoclassical statues from Paris as well. Of course, with so many children dying in the family, it is no surprise that the spirits of children are seen inside the house and even around the outside. They are blamed for pranks like taking objects and eyeglasses. They have literally taken dozens of glasses over the years. Even slipped them out of people's purses. <laughs> oh my I don't know what the fascination is with them, but... There could be other reasons for supernatural activity in the house. In 1923, when Herbert Latimer inherited the house, the deal was that his aunt through marriage had to be allowed to stay in the house until her death. Her name was Margaret Mears Latimer, and she had become friends with an artist named Elizabeth Chant, who had come to town in 1922. She invited Chant to live at the mansion with her. One of Chant's interests was communicating with the spiritual world. Could she have invited spirits into the house that never left? And let's not forget that the fencing was taken from the Oakdale Cemetery. Could this be why contractors who were doing repairs after a fire in 1981 heard the sounds of furniture being dragged across the wooden floor on the fourth floor? There was no furniture on the fourth floor. Oh, my. And that Oakdale Cemetery that we've mentioned a couple times here now, we did get to go visit that while we were in Wilmington. We did a bonus cast on it. So for those of you who are executive producers, you got to hear a Stones and Bones on Oakdale Cemetery. That's right. And I wish we had known about this story to go check out the plot. Yes. To see where the fence was removed. Yeah, I wonder where the fence would have been. <laughs> the kitchen and dining room are said to be the most active areas. Chairs get moved around the dining room. There's the smell of pipe smoke in the dining room and a putrid smell that comes from the kitchen. The smell is described like death. That's why you got to take your garbage out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And could possibly be because a cypress table in the kitchen was used for laying out the bodies of the children before burial, although one has to wonder who would do that with a table where food is prepared. So that quite possibly is a legend. I just can't even imagine. We also have to assume that this cypress table is original to the home, but I just can't imagine you take dead bodies and put it on something where you're preparing your food too. So perhaps something else causes the smell. The bodies could have been placed elsewhere here because this is down in the cellar where it's cool. So I'm sure most of our listeners are aware that they would put kitchens downstairs because it was just cooler in the summer. And also, if you had a fire, it's a little bit easier to contain it there. Otherwise, they had the separate building that was their kitchen, too. Among the things found in the house was a first edition book of poetry by Emily Dickinson. The staff thought it would be a good idea to sell it to raise funds for the Historical Society. And then they realized it was a bad idea when the book and a wicker basket levitated five feet off the ground and started trembling. I would okay. think the original owners are not happy about that. <laughs> Needless to say, the book went back on the shelf. Wise decision. Next up, we have the Bellamy Mansion. John Dillard Bellamy was a wealthy merchant and doctor and eventually one of the largest slaveholders in North Carolina. He married Eliza Harris in 1839 and they had 10 children together. Eliza had been the daughter of the man whom John studied medicine under. John received much of his early wealth from his father, who owned a plantation in South Carolina. Bellamy eventually got involved in founding banks, and he invested in the railroad. His merchant work came mostly through a tar and turpentine operation. He and Eliza started building their mansion in 1859 at 503 Market Street. The home was designed by architect James F. Post, and when it was completed in 1861, it covered 10,000 square feet and had 22 rooms with carved woodwork throughout. The design incorporates several architectural styles, including Italianate, 
Greek Revival, and Neoclassical. A 10-foot-wide colonnade porch wraps around three sides of the house that have pocket doors, making it easily accessible for many rooms. The top of the mansion features a belvedere with arched windows, and 14 Corinthian columns support a three-story portico. And Kelly, you'll remember that the pocket doors are basically the windows that just go up into the wall. Yes, I loved that. I thought it was so cool. And they're big windows, so they're, they look like they're a door. They're so big, so people can go through them. Yellow fever swept through Wilmington and Bellamy evacuated his family in 1862. He'd already been planning on leaving as the Civil War raged, and he had heard that Wilmington would be invaded by the Union. Wilmington did fall to the Union in 1865, and the mansion was occupied as a headquarters. Dr. Bellamy wasn't allowed to return to his home after the war until he signed an oath of allegiance to the United States and set all of his slaves free with a guarantee he would never own slaves again. And a lot of people might be wondering, how in the world was he the biggest slave owner in North Carolina when he didn't really own a plantation? He's got this house in the middle of town. Well, all of those businesses that I was talking about was all slave labor. So the Tar and Turpentine Company, all of that used slaves. The Bellamy children were successful with one becoming a doctor, two became lawyers, one became a pharmacist, another a farmer, and there was a politician. Mary Elizabeth was the only daughter to marry and have children. Her sisters Eliza and Ellen never married and lived together in the family home. Ellen lived to be 93 and died in 1946. She was the last Bellamy to live in the mansion. The house remained in the possession of the Bellamy family until 1972 when it was given to a nonprofit who restored it and opened it as a museum. Also on the property, there is a two-story slave quarters built from brick. The building measures one room deep and three rooms wide and was typical of slave quarters found in the city. They were more comfortable than the smaller slave huts found on plantations. The added comfort included a laundry room, four sleeping chambers, and two five-seat privies. Yeah, so I don't know if that was on the inside or right on the outside. I'm, I'm thinking it was on the inside. This building was also designed by James F. Post and has similar elements as the mansion. Post also designed the original carriage house that was destroyed in a hurricane in 1946. A new one was built to replace it. No one is thought to have died in the house, and yet ghost stories persist in connection to the house. A neat stack of buttons were found beneath the floorboards of the slave quarters, and it is believed that this is in accordance with West African tradition as a way to keep evil spirits at bay. Was this a common tradition for slave builders to do, or was there a reason they were afraid that evil might invade the quarters? It makes me wonder if they ripped up the floorboards over in the house, if you'd find stacks of buttons there, too, because the slaves are the ones who built everything. So if they were putting these in, these elements in as they were building just to protect the houses. Could be. Makes you wonder if they were doing that all over. One of the most interesting ghost tales took place in the 1990s when a film crew was using the mansion. A couple of the crew were scouting the location and they went into the library where they found boxes and boxes of old papers from the Bellamy family. They started rifling through them when they heard the front door slam. They figured it was a security guard until they heard heavy booted footfalls coming down the hallway quickly. The library door slammed open and a rush of icy wind blew through, knocking papers everywhere. The men were startled and ran out into the hallway, out the front door, down the stairs, and out to the sidewalk. I think they were just a little tiny bit fearful. The door slammed behind them and they heard what sounded like two fists beating the other side of the door. They never went in the house again. Makes me wonder, did they actually film there? I mean... It sounds like they continued, but the scouts were like, "Uh, yeah, it's a great house. We're out. (laughs) It meets approval. (laughs) Bye-bye. Another story concerns reenactors. A group of them were camped out inside the house the day before the event. In the middle of the night, several said that they were shaken awake by a man in a Union uniform. He would give them all a weird look. The next morning, several of the reenactors were talking to each other about their experience the night before with this man. They looked around their group and realized that they were all dressed as Confederates. There was no Union uniform among them. As a matter of fact, the Union reenactors had all spent the night at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Imagine how confused the Union soldier must have been being surrounded by all these Confederates. Makes you wonder why he was shaking them away. You know, you'd think he'd be like, oh, I'm surrounded and he'd creep out. (laughs) Not want to wake any of them. (laughs) How did I end up in the middle of all these guys? Ellen Bellamy was the last Bellamy in the house, and there are some odd experiences connected to her. She used a wheelchair in her later years, and it's still in the house. It travels from room to room. And while the staff has tried to blame guests who are there because of certain events like weddings and such, people claim that they don't move the chair. And oftentimes it will just appear behind them in such a way that they turn around and nearly fall over it. So there's definitely a prankster here. Others claim to feel uneasy around it. Some feel as though the chair is following them. They'll walk from one room to the next, and the chair is all of a sudden in the previous room. 
Can you imagine? You're like looking behind you going, <laughs> I don't think that wheelchair was there. And then you go over to the next room, and then you look behind you and you're like, uh, I know it wasn't in that room. <laughs> and just see the little wheelchair creeping. <laughs> Make a good cartoon. There's also a black spot on the wall connected to Ellen. She'd lay in bed in her later years reading the newspaper and she'd get, you know, all that ink that you get off the newspaper on your hands. Sure. Get your hands all black. Well, she'd reach up when she was getting ready to go to bed to turn off the wall sconce. And as she's doing it, she would end up getting a little bit of that black on the wall. So imagine she's doing this every single night for however many months and years. There was quite a buildup by the time she passed away. The stain has been painted over several times and it always manages to come back. So is she still <laughs> flicking off that wall sconce as she's reading her newspaper? Or is there something about that ink that just bleeds through the paint? And then next we have Captain Ellerbrock and Boss. And I think everybody cried when the tour guide told us this story. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> For those of you who've heard the stones and bones about Oakdale Cemetery, you'll know a little bit about this story. There is a building at the corner of Front and Dock Street that has hosted a series of businesses like the Husk Restaurant. And the building had a bad fire and a haunting. William Ellerbrock was a captain of a steam tug. He was also a volunteer member of Hook and Ladder Company No. 1. On April 10, 1880, the captain heard the fire alarm, and when he saw how big the fire was, he quickly ran from his tugboat. The captain had a dog named Boss with him as well, who followed after him as he ran for the fire. The captain asked a bystander to watch his dog before he raced into the building to help anyone who may be trapped. The fire got worse, and the firefighters all pulled out of the building. Shortly thereafter, a scream was heard coming from inside the building, and Boss broke free and ran into the building, having recognized his master's voice. Nobody's sure exactly what kind of dog Boss was. I'd seen a newspaper article in Newfoundland, and that's how I referenced it in the Stones and Bones that we did. But we've also heard that it was a smaller dog, because some stories say he handed the dog off like for the person to hold the dog. <laughs> Obviously, somebody's not holding a big Newfie. Right. And then also the sculpture that they put. I mean, it is a carving of a smaller looking dog. Yeah. With smooth coat and yeah. everything. <laughs> Newfies have big, thick coats. Yeah. So I would think, I don't know necessarily that they were trying to match the dog, if it was just a regular old dog picture they had. So Could that's be. what they do. The fire had to be allowed to burn itself out. When the fire crew entered the building the next morning, they found the body of the captain. He was lying face down with a heavy timber over him so that he could not get out of the building. Boss had found him and tried to save him. Boss was found with part of the captain's coat in his mouth, so it was clear that he had tried to drag his owner to safety. Boss was right next to the captain, so it was also clear that he realized he would not be able to get his master out, and so he stayed and died with the captain. The two friends were put in the casket together and interred at Oakdale Cemetery beneath a headstone that features the carving of a dog curled up with the inscription, Faithful Unto Death. The captain and Boss are said to still haunt the building. Our tour guide had been doing some setup in the building when it was being used for a haunted house attraction, and he heard the whining of a dog himself. Many people have heard the whining and barking of a dog throughout the building. During some renovations, an electrician and his crew were working in an upstairs corner when they heard the whining of a dog in the building. They followed the sound but found no dog. What the electrician did find was a very dangerous electrical problem, and if he had switched out whatever he was working on, it would have caused a fire. He decided against doing the work because it was too much of a fire hazard. So it would seem that Boss is there to protect people, for sure. And I thought it was cool that our personal tour guide actually had an experience in the building, which makes it a little bit more, maybe that is a possibility. Yeah, definitely. And as I've told on podcasts that I get interviewed on, and I've said it here on our podcast many times, is that I've actually heard that whining of a dog at Waverly Hills. So I know it's definitely a possibility because I've heard that kind of thing for myself. Next, we have the Cotton Exchange. Seems like all these old historical cities have a Cotton Exchange. It's a line of boutiques, shops, and restaurants located at 321 North Front Street. This used to be a place nicknamed Patty's Hollow, and the history of that has more than likely left some negative spiritual residue. There once was an old pond here called Horse Pond that had a fenced paddock near it that was known as Paddock's Hollow. Eventually, that shortened to Patty's Hollow. This was low-lying and muddy land that nobody wanted, and in the 1700s, squatters started setting up a shantytown that took in all types. There was not just the poor and freed slaves here, but opium addicts, alcoholics, and women plying the sex trade. The area became so dangerous that even the police would not enter it, particularly after three officers were attacked by a gang. Front Street Methodist Church set up shop near Patty's Hollow, perhaps to try to clean up the place, but that didn't work out. 
Stories claim that the riffraff drowned out the Sunday morning sermons. I'm surprised they were up for Sunday morning to make that much noise. (laughs) This is true. But you can imagine the pastor. One of my favorite movies is Fried Green Tomatoes. And I think about the pastors trying to do a sermon in church and Iggy's out there with some of her buddies and they're all hollering about you people that are there in church were just down here last night partying and gambling. (laughs) Right. And he can hardly do his sermon. A fire in 1886 destroyed the hollow and the church, which rebuilt in a different location and became today's Grace Methodist United Church. There was a problem, though. The church had a churchyard, and they didn't move the cemetery with them. Instead, the bodies were dug up and reinterred in Oakdale Cemetery. Maybe. Built over this place were business buildings, many of which were connected to the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. When the railroad left in 1955, these buildings were left abandoned, and this became the seedy spot in town once again. In the 1970s, it was decided to remodel, and the cotton exchange was put together. And this added to the majesty of Wilmington. You can dress up a bad spot in history, but that doesn't do away with spiritual energy. And many of the businesses here claim to have hauntings. First up, we have the Top Toad. This clothing and souvenir shop has been in business for 25 years, and the activity has been here since day one. Hangers on display racks move on their own. Disembodied footsteps are heard, as well as disembodied voices. Employees claim it is as though they have invisible patrons. Some of this activity has been picked up on security cameras. Spirits appear as murky, shadowy figures. Shirts are found unfolded and displays knocked down when employees open the store in the mornings. Next, we have the German Cafe. This German restaurant has been in business since 1985 and serves up schnitzel, wurst, Rubens, German potato salad, and house-made desserts like the Napoleon, which happens to be my favorite thing. Have you ever had Napoleon? I have not. Ooh, they're good. Nice and creamy. The interior has exposed beams and old brickwork and one ghost. There's the spirit of a female wearing a Victorian dress that is seen around dinner time at the top of the steps leading to the upper dining room. One of the owners named Harvey was locking up one night. He had turned off the kitchen lights and was getting ready to shut off the hallway lights when he saw something out of the corner of his eye. When he glanced over, he saw a woman standing on the landing. He described the dress as being colored purple with a black lace trim. She seemed unaware of him and eventually vanished. Other employees claim to feel as though someone is watching them that they can't see. Another haunted restaurant here is Patty's Hollow Pub and Restaurant. This is a restaurant and pub that serves up shepherd's pies, burgers, steaks, salads, and beer. This restaurant has a man in black who visits on occasion, and perhaps this is because it is near the former graveyard. This entity made its first appearance during renovations. They were in the process of drilling holes in the brick for new beer lines when the manager looked up and saw this man in black. This figure had long, wavy black hair and a long black frock and was leaning against the open door to the kitchen. The restaurant was closed, so he assumed the man was an intruder. The man quickly turned and ran through the kitchen door, slamming the door. The manager ran after the figure into the kitchen and found no one there. And the rear door had stacks of boxes in front of it, so clearly the figure didn't leave that way. There was an ice cream shop here called The Scoop. It closed and may now be Nutty Buddy's Ice Cream and Sandwiches. I'm not for sure on that. I just know that the story that I'm going to tell you is related to The Scoop, but The Scoop is no longer there. The ghost story of the former Scoop shop features a little girl's apparition who's rather playful. She plays with all the appliances in the store like the blender, microwave, and mixer. She'll flip channels on the radio, knock over the napkin keepers, and run her hands through the wind chimes. Employees claim to have seen the little girl's image in the glass case in the store and in the clock face. So you can imagine if you're polishing it up and shining it up and you look down and you're like, there is a child standing next to me and there's no kid here. The former owner was in the shop alone when she felt something playing with her hair. She spun around and saw that she was indeed alone. She went back to her work and felt her shirt being tugged. She spun around and saw nothing again. She once again went back to her work. When the tag of her shirt was pulled out over her collar, she finally yelled out, I don't have time for this right now. That was it for the pranks. The sweet southern drawl of a little girl is sometimes heard as well. Next we have Paradise Alley. During the time of the pirates, there was a street that was known for its taverns, pubs, and brothels. Of course, it had the nickname of Paradise Alley. This infamous lane ran from Market Street to Dock Street, just off Front Street. The men coming in off the ships could walk the alley and survey the women calling to them from the upper windows of the buildings. Yoo-hoo. Oh, my word. <laughs> the Blue Post was a favorite brothel, and this was run by a madam named Gallus Meg. That Gallus part is derived from the word gallows. Meg was not to be messed with as she stood six feet tall and weighed over 350 pounds. She could bounce an ill-mannered pirate in a matter of seconds. 
she was her own bodyguard. She was. She I was mean, her own bouncer. She not only had the girls working upstairs, but this was her bar. So she was the bartender and the bouncer. She just handled everything. <laughs> and Meg did more than just bounce an unruly customer. She'd bite off his ear and save it in a pickling jar. Yummy. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> Can you imagine her walking into the bar with his ear in her mouth? This jar was kept at the back of the bar to serve as a warning. Some stories claim that there was a finger or two in that jar as well. Oh, boy. <laughs> so apparently it didn't matter what part. She'll just bite it off. Can you imagine being a stranger in town? You're like, oh, I'll just have whatever you've got on tap. And then you, you look, look behind her and go, what in the? <laughs> a woman who ruled this establishment with an iron fist would certainly not give up her post just because she has died. Oh, no. Meg is still here taking out customers. The place eventually became a restaurant called Water Street Restaurant that closed and is now Michael's on the waterfront. Employees who have worked at this location have claimed that Gallus Meg haunts the place because they have seen her spirit several times. She mostly hangs out in the ladies' room and goes after any men who accidentally stumble inside. The story goes that she tries to grab them by the throat as they flee the restroom. And of course, it's the ladies' restroom that's haunted. It's always the ladies' restroom. So we have to deal with lines and ghosts. <laughs> this is true. Next, we have the story of Samuel Jocelyn. During our ghost walk, we stood outside of St. James Cemetery, and our guide told us about a man who was buried alive. You remember that story? Certainly do. This man was Samuel Jocelyn, and he fell off his horse in the early 1800s and fell into an icy pond of water. And medicine being what it was then, they assumed he was dead when he was found two days later. Story goes that he was buried, and when he awoke, he found himself underground and needing help. Samuel had a friend named Alexander Holster, whom he called Sandy. They found themselves one night getting into a debate with some other men about the topic of life after death. Both Samuel and Sandy believed that the spirit went on. The two men made a pact at the end of the debate that whichever one of them died first, that man would return to the other to prove that he went on. Sounds kind of like Houdini and his wife. Sandy was devastated at the loss of his friend, and the night after they buried Samuel, Sandy found himself weeping in front of the fire, and when he looked up, he saw his friend sitting there. Sandy was terrified as he listened to his friend whisper that he wanted Sandy to come dig him up. Sandy fainted, and when he awoke, the spirit was gone. He figured he'd dreamed it. The same thing happened the next night. Sandy still did nothing, and Samuel appeared for a third time. Sandy went to a friend to see what he thought. This friend believed in the supernatural, and he agreed to help Samuel, and so, under the cover of darkness, they dug up Samuel's coffin. What they found shocked them. Samuel was turned over in his coffin, and his fingers were raw from scratching the lid. He was clearly now dead after being buried alive. And for that reason, it's said that Samuel haunts his grave. People hear the sounds of scratching at the gate of St. James Cemetery. Muffled cries are heard coming from the grave. And next we have the Price Goss House, which is located at 514 Market Street, which is also a place once referred to as Gallows Hill. This location is one of the most active in all of Wilmington, and that could be because this site isn't nicknamed Gallows Hill for nothing. This was where public hangings were carried out, and many men lost their lives here. Unclaimed bodies were buried nearby. Eventually, the apparatus was moved to a different area and the land was sold. Dr. William Price had been a lieutenant colonel during the Civil War and was a medical doctor, and he bought the plot and decided to build his dream home here, on Gallows Hill. This house would include his office. The two-story Italianate-styled house was completed in 1860 and had 12 rooms. Dr. Price died shortly after the Civil War, and his son Joseph Price inherited the property. He would become the harbor master of Wilmington. He rented out the property from 1881 to 1899 to Frederick Reinstein. His daughter, Dr. Alice Reinstein Bernheim, wrote in a letter to the Wilmington Morning Star in 1957 about her experiences living in the house. All sorts of human bones were found by us when we dug in the backyard. Wonderful. <laughs> Imagine the kids back there going, oh, let's dig in this sandbox. Do, 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 do. Oh, what in the world is this a lake femur. bone? <laughs> wonder if that's why she became a doctor. Could be. Thomas J. Goss, a captain of the 115th Machine Battalion of the 30th Division in World War I, owned the house later. He had grown up in the house. In 1968, the house passed on to the Greater Wilmington Chamber of Commerce, who used this as their headquarters until 1991. Today, it houses the architectural firm Bowman Murray Hemingway Architects. Stories of paranormal happenings date all the way back to the time of the prices. The minute a house was put on this property, the energy was unsettled and a variety of weird things started happening. Servants started complaining that items in the kitchen would move around on their own. 
doors would open and close on their own. The ghost of James Peckham, who was hanged in the 1700s for stealing a purse, is said to wander the halls. This could be because he always maintained his innocence. Snakes also infested the home, Kelly. You'd be so excited. I could go wrangle them. Uh, You could. (laughs) I'd be like running around screaming, I'm going to die, burn the whole thing down. And you'd be like, oh, come on, we're just going to get a few play friends here. Say hello to my little friend. Exactly, you would. Early one morning, a snake was found slithering across a bedroom floor, and then another snake was found in a shoe the next day. Must have been kind of small. Another was found in the bottom of a knitting bag. Clearly, there was an infestation, and when they started ripping open walls, they found many snakes. Is it because this was a creepy house, or is it just they the were just looking? To they look were just for looking spot? for a new home. <laughs> <laughs> Later, owners would describe smelling pipe tobacco. The mysterious sound of metal clanking has been described, and a local historian, Lewis Philip Hall, claims that this could be from the chains of prisoners being marched to their deaths. Many people walking past the house have looked up and seen figures standing in the upstairs windows. These people are always wearing period clothing. Lynn Goss, who was married to Thomas Goss Jr., described an experience they had in the house shortly after they married. She noticed an eerie chill in the room, and at the same time, something pulled the covers off the bed. Another ghost has been nicknamed George, and he's been seen bounding down the stairs and then disappearing. He's an old man who smiles and wears period clothing. Doesn't it seem like a lot of places name their ghost George? (laughs) It does. And I can't really imagine an older gentleman bounding downstairs. (laughs) But he's a ghost, so he's young again. An upstairs office has windows that even frost up during the summer. Sometimes people standing outside will look up and see the frost and then see the word help appear in the frost. Eastern Paranormal are investigators who caught EVPs inside the house and other anomalies. Jane J. Ghost Seekers investigated as well, getting some weird pictures and fluctuations in EMF. One picture is said to show a shadow figure peeking through a window and pulling a curtain open. The side yard makes people uncomfortable, and this is where several graves have been found. John Hershack, who started the Ghost Walk of Wilmington tour, told the Star News Online about an experience his tour group had outside this house. He took his tour past the supposedly haunted Price Goss House on Market Street when two women in his group screamed. Their shrieks caused the eyes of others in the group to widen and direct their gaze to just over her check's shoulder, where multiple people claimed to have seen a ghost in the window of the home, which is now the offices of an architectural firm. As people scattered into the street, her check chased after them, trying to take control of the situation. It was too late. His guests were visibly shaken. The ghost tour claims that many people have gotten physically ill when standing outside the house in the area where the bones have been found. He not only started the Ghost Walk of Wilmington, he also wrote the book Ghosts of Old Wilmington, which all of us bought while we were there. One of the employees at the architect firm asked if he could sleep over in the house one night after a hurricane had damaged his home. He was exhausted when he finally went to sleep, and he fell asleep quickly. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by the slamming around of furniture on the first floor. He grabbed his bedding, ran for his car, and drove to Walmart to sleep in the parking lot there. The next morning, his manager asked why he hadn't slept the night there, and he explained that he had but left after what happened. The manager looked around the first floor, and none of the furniture was out of place. It was really cute, too. When he ran out of the house, he left the back door open, and he didn't grab his clothes. (laughs) So when he came back, he was in his pajamas. Oh, my gosh. Poor guy. I mean, clearly something terrified him. Wilmington is a fun town with great food, craft beer, ghost tours and hunts, and wonderful historic buildings. It is worth taking the time to visit. And just maybe you might experience something weird there. Are these places in Wilmington haunted? That That is for you to decide. Yeah, we had a great time there. And I think we mentioned when we did the episode on the USS North Carolina that we ate at the Rooster and Crow restaurant. Oh, it was so good. So they got some great stuff there. They have all kinds of restaurants and brew pubs and things like that. So it's really neat little place to check out. And you definitely want to see the USS North Carolina. It was amazing. Oh, absolutely. I want to encourage you guys to check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. Over on Instagram, I'd gotten a message. It was from Nick. And he said, I've been following your Instagram and I think it's amazing. I recently started a page I think your audience may be interested in called Spooky Houses for Sale. And I'm trying to get the word out. So I'm giving him a little shout out. So if you want to follow him over on Instagram, you can do that. Of course, I 
let him know that we're always looking for a house that we can use as a clubhouse. Absolutely. Of course, it has to be centralized and, I don't know, maybe a few <laughs> thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be in our budget, but then we'd have a really cool place to hang out. We want to thank Kristen, one of our executive producers, sent us a book in the mail for the county that she's from, Berks County. And it's a book that she had read. I think she said it was the first ghost book she'd ever read. She did. And she's read it over and over again. It's from several years ago. So thank you so much for sending that. We appreciate it. Most definitely. Scott Booker sent us some more books. We appreciate that as well. And he made us a little Bernie meme with on the logo <laughs> that I shared up in the Spooktacular crew. We've got uh, a Bernie Sanders on our history book that's bouncing upward. Yes. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> as those memes are making the round. Then we got this really cool. I love when we get emails like this. So this is from a girl named Carrie who did not listen to our show, but she had a friend send it to her. So she says, hi, my roommate just forwarded me your podcast on Ohio. And this is on Ohio University. And my hair stood straight up when you talked about Jefferson Hall. And this is actually episode 339. This is Ohio University. You see, my roommate and I lived in 325 Jefferson Hall in 1991 to 1992. So she actually was in college at the same time that we were. Indeed. We were clueless freshmen, and on the regular, we would hear what we thought were ping pong balls bouncing on the floor above us. Wow. For people who don't recall, we described Jefferson Hall had this sound like marbles falling on the floor. So I think it's really cool that all of a sudden she was like, yeah, we thought they were ping pong balls. This happened so often it became a joke between us, with my roommate bringing a ping pong ball from home one weekend and would position it so that I caused it to fall by, say, opening my closet door. But I digress. So they were playing pranks <laughs> on each other with it. When I heard your podcast, I know that the marbles is what we were hearing. We went upstairs after being exasperated by the noise to find out what they were doing. Dropping hairpins, playing quarters. There was no one in the room. Door closed. Lights out. Being reasonable people, we just assumed they'd left. But now? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> I cannot even tell you how often we heard that noise. Thanks for the hair-raising trip down memory lane. Very cool. So not only do I love to hear that you guys are sharing episodes with other people who might not be listening, so now they'll listen to other ones, but that was just a little line that we threw in at the end of Jefferson Hall because there was another building I remember there that described the same thing as these marbles falling down. Right. Never heard that description ever before, but there were two buildings on this campus that had that, and I thought, yeah, sure, okay, I'll throw that in there. But here we have somebody who lived underneath it and heard it. So awesome. I love it. Thank you for sharing that, Carrie. And thank you to your roommate for sharing the podcast. And then finally, we heard from Jennifer. And this goes back to our Velisca House episode where we did the investigation. She says, I've never emailed a stranger before, but something's compelling me to do so. I just recently found your podcast this week, and I've been listening to a few of them today. I was listening to the Velisca House investigation episode 310. When it came to the spirit box session, I really tuned in to listen as spirit boxes are something so uncertain to me and I've had an interesting encounter with one. Anyway, at minute 46, 40 seconds, you are talking about a response you got. You hear the spirit box say what seems like exactly, and then she thought it was Peter saying this, and then you hear Peter say it said exactly, I got total goosebumps because it was almost the exact same inflection and tone as Peter's voice and the spirit box response. Go back and pull the audio and listen to it. The spirit box says it, and then Peter says it. You and I both sat down. I'm like, okay, well, let me go back and listen. And you kept saying, no, I don't know. First of all, you were like, that's Dolly. Right, right. That's Dolly's response. Because it goes so fast, it's hard to tell exactly who's talking. But you were like, no, that's definitely Dolly. When I listen to it, and I'm going to play it for everybody, it sounds like the spirit box is saying, it said exactly. And then Dolly says, it said exactly. Right. So it's bizarro. Really, yeah. It's like, <laughs> why would the spirit box be responding? It said exactly when the answer we were expecting to be exactly just exactly by itself. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Then she goes on to say, now the reason this came to me 
is that a month ago or so, I was listening to an old paranormal podcast with Jim Harold. I know a lot of our listeners tune in. I do. And they were talking to a man who was researching spirit boxes and such, and he had some really far out ideas about them and claimed that he and his group get their own voices and voices of their friends who are living to come through the boxes. I totally dismissed that idea right away as it is something that I can't totally wrap my mind around. But when I heard your recording, I just got the chills and said, that is Peter's voice. It's almost like a time jump or something. I don't know. Just really weird. No logical explanation can I provide. Just really weird. And who knows how the psyche works? I wish I could tell you what paranormal podcast I was listening to, but I binged so many of his the past month. I just don't know when it was. Well, thank you so much for pointing that out, Jennifer. And I don't know, what do you guys think? Listening back to it, Kelly, we always talk about we don't know what a spirit is, if it's a time-space continuum thing. Is it possible that these audio anomalies are some kind of a time thing? Yeah, I don't know. It definitely raises a lot of questions. And we have picked up EVPs. And also, when we were watching Kindred Spirits the other night, To me, it sounded like when they were doing their spirit box sessions or even their EVPs, that sometimes it would say the same word as the last word in the sentence. Like they would be saying, let's say they're asking, what color is the box? Or can you light up the box? And then all of a sudden the voice will say box. Right. And I kept thinking to myself, is it that it's a spirit that's just repeating what they're hearing? Are they answering? Or is that an audio anomaly? that it's picking up from that person in the audio recording and just repeating that last word again. Yeah, possibly. All these things we just don't have answers (laughs) to. But thank you for pointing that out, Jennifer. Fascinating stuff. I want to thank you all for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the cemetery, Carrie Spencer. We're going to be burying you under a chest tomb. Thank you so much for supporting HGB. Join me in the cemetery by becoming an executive producer. You can join on Patreon or PayPal. Check out the support the show tab on the website for more information. called for a nationwide fundraising campaign and lapel pills lapel pills <laughs> i don't even want <laughs> to be difficult to hold on to your your lapel you, <laughs> <laughs> you just put the pills on your jacket i guess for later it's production of navel 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 this ominous name reflected the rough waters and foreboding shore shoal shores shoal, <laughs> shoals shoals yes. Was it the Shoals or the Shores? Shoals is hard to say, (laughs) apparently. (laughs) Why were you giving me that look? Did you hear my stomach growl? (laughs) Actually, no. I was just watching you read. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of what it sounded like. (laughs) If we were doing a ghost investigation right now, we'd be like, did you hear that growl on the EVP? Dude, run. Zebulon Latimer was a... Zebulon (laughs) Latimer... Zebulon and Latimer are pretty hard to put together. Actually, Zebulon kind of screws up your whole mouth. Listeners, you try it. Say Zebulon a few times and then see what you can say <laughs> after it. Zebulon Latimer was a success. I, successful is what's giving me the hard time. Oh. <laughs> Zebulon Latimer was a, was a very successful man. One of the most successful in Old Wilmington. And I put success in there three times. Ha ha ha. Brat. And his success. <laughs> I'm going to use success all the time now. <laughs> My arm is long enough to reach across this little table that we're recording (laughs) at, you know. (laughs) If you guys hear a thump, it's my head. (laughs) Adding some foley. Zebulon married Elizabeth Savage and they had their... I thought I was going to say 10,000 kids. (laughs) Oh my God. She popped out 10,000 babies. We thought 13 on the last episode was a lot. 
one of Chant's interests was communicating with the spiritual world. <laughs> spiritual world. <laughs> what is the spiritual world? With the spiritual. I can't say that word. What is world, world. spiritual? Spi- I'm trying to put an R in there for some reason. With the spiritual world. You can dress up a bald spot in history. <laughs> bald spot. You can dress up a bald spot in history. What exactly is a bald spot in history? <laughs> First up, we have the toad. The toad tap is what I was going to say. The toad tap sounds like a place that has some good brews. That's what I was thinking. It was. <laughs> First up, we have the top toad. Early one morning, a steak. A steak? <laughs> <laughs> a steak was found. I hope it was Slithering. cooked medium. I hope it was cooked medium rare because that's my favorite. Me too. 